Sabbath rest in architecture. Oh, I don't know whether that means it, that he heard it or not, but it doesn't matter. So it's a busy month, um, but I do want to introduce Bram Grossman, um, which I'm sure has not been pronounced correctly, um, <laughs> from the University of Amsterdam, who um, who is a, uh, I, I don't mean this in any patronizing way, but he's a young but exceptionally uh, talented scholar um, and who has particular uh, interest in Boris Lurie and has co-curated a number of exhibitions, um, even at this tender uh, age that he is. And I'm only saying that because I'm now feeling so old uh, that it's wonderful to have you here. But I want to introduce the lecture in a slightly different way because I think it's important you understand a little bit about the background of Boris Lurie and how Ben Uri and I particularly got involved. I first saw some of his work um, in a book maybe five, six years ago. And I was, I was shocked. I was quite taken aback at some of the representations of the Holocaust, which he, he more than as any survivor does, he understood it in a purely authentic way because he lived through it and survived it, whilst the rest of us were fortunate enough to, to read about it and to empathize and to, to feel it, but not to live it. And we had conversations and it was only on actually meeting the people um, involved, particularly Raphael, um, who heads up the foundation in terms of in Europe. Um, did I start to understand in reading, reading books about him that this was not just a, an image that was perhaps on the surface you'd imagine to be superficial and, and offensive. Um, this was an image by a man who was quite unique in many ways. Every survivor is unique. Uh, the very nature, the very fact that they survived gives them a uniqueness. But he was an extraordinary figure in that he wanted the story, whatever the stories were that he wanted, he wanted people to connect with that story, to understand that story, and to be shocked or riveted or stopped in their tracks by that story. And he did that by juxtaposing the surreal, if you like, with the real. And initially, you would look at it and you may well be really quite offended by it. But you have to take into account that he was a survivor. He lived through that. And he had the creativity and the artistic talent to be able to juxtapose, as I, I, I describe it as a surreal to the real. I'm sure that Bram's going to correct me and tell me that it's a different terminology and to make you stop, and, and he succeeds in making you stop. And where it has real strength is its authenticity, it, its relevance, its potency. But if somebody was to do this who hadn't survived the camps, then I think one's response would be very different. And I wanted to say that right at the beginning, because I, I, I'm sure that Bram will show us some images which um, most people would not expect to see. And I've said to, to him and, and to Raphael Bostelli, who's in charge of the, uh, the sort of European side of, of the foundation, that we're an art museum. Uh, and if it's valid in artistic terms, then we will show it. So I wanted to brief you on that. I want to introduce now Bram, who will take you through. Um, he's been the co-curator of five exhibitions uh, of Boris Lurie. So there's uh, perhaps uh, Professor Daniel Loeb, who, who you've worked with, would be, uh, he just can't be with us tonight, but, uh, but we've got his partner in crime. Um, and Bram, I'm going to hand it over to you without saying any more. Please introduce yourself a little bit more than I've given. I wanted to concentrate on, on the artist himself. And, um, and it's over to you, my friend. Thank you. Great. Thank you, David. Um, well, thanks for the kind words. I did not curate five shows, oh. slightly less. Uh, just so you won't look into my CV and think I'm a fraud. Um, my name is Bram Gunteman. 
Um, I'm a master's student at the University of Amsterdam. And as already said, I co-curated the exhibition of Boris Lurie together with Wolf Stel in The Hague last year. Um, through that exhibition, I got involved with the Boris Lurie Art Foundation. Um, and I've helped with several projects, um, mainly in The Hague and Berlin. Um, today, we're gonna take a look at Boris Lurie. Um, my heart will always reek of Deutschland. Um, I took as the title, uh, which comes from this po a poem he wrote, which I would like to read to you first before we start um, with the actual talk. I put it here in the original German version, the way he wrote it in the font in which he published it, which I'll say a bit more on later. Um, and on the right, the English translation, will, which I will recite to you. Germany lies buried in the flesh, close to my heart. The evacuated graves are two lady fingers, red nail polished. Thus my heart beating itself on the kitchen chopping block will always reek of Deutschland. It calls me to judgment before the cooks and into the pot pie. Today we'll take a look at the life and work of Boris Lerny, an artist and writer whose course of life has been altered so significantly by his experiences during the Shoah that he once thank thanked Adolf Hitler himself in an open letter for the lessons he taught him. When asked about his resume, he would always say, Student Art League of New York, Stutthof, Buchenwald, Lenta. Uh, an artist who spent the majority of his career rejecting the very structures that were necessary for him to succeed as an artist. An artist whose work seemed so grotesque to many that he probably would not um, have sold anything anyways. And an artist who, despite barely selling anything, died filthy rich, basically out of spite. Boris Lurie was a man of complications and contradictions who did not shy away from any type of confrontation during his long and diverse career. Born in 1924 in Leningrad, present day St. Petersburg, Lurie spent his childhood first in Riga and later in several labor and concentration camps. When he's liberated from Buchenwald at 20 years old, he works for the US Counterintelligence Corps as a translator before moving to New York City with his father in 1947. His mother, grandmother, younger sister, and girlfriend were among the 13,000 Jews shot at the Rumbala massacre just four months after the German invasion of Riga. In the safety of his new home, Lurie is finally able to reflect on his experiences and starts to do so through his art. After a long series of drawings documenting his time in the camp, his complicated relationship with the loss of most of his female close family starts to emerge in a long series of dismembered women and SM-themed portraits. His new helmet also did not escape his scrutiny. After the initial culture shock, he starts to see contradictions and hypocrisies in his new home. Besides the consumerist abundance that so starkly contrasts, contrasts his experiences in war-torn Europe, he mostly takes offense to the U.S. imperialist tendencies. He takes a firm stance against the U.S. militarist, militarist system, together with fellow artists Sam Goodman and Stanley Fisher, uh, two artists with whom he forms the core of the no art movement that besides the aforementioned societal critique takes a hard stance against the art world itself. Above all, however, despite post-war society's ability to gloss over the atrocities of the recent past, Lurie makes it his life mission to help cure the societal amnesia by forcing the people to face the facts through a series of intense explicit collages. Not only was Lurie active in the visual arts, but he also wrote extensively. Besides his mem memoirs, the first part of which was published posthumously as In Riga. He also wrote a novel and many poems, one of which we just saw. The novel, House of Anita, combines impressions of the New York, of New York, the art world, concentration camps, and sadomasochist brothels in a harrowing semi-autobiographical narrative. Unsurprisingly, neither his upsetting writings nor his visually, let's call them unattractive uh, paintings sold well. Um, and with most of the art world alienated, Lurie lacked the basic infrastructure to exhibit outside of his closed circus, circles. Um, luckily for us, uh, Lurie also had a big, big uh, need for validation. Setting out to do nothing but show his father that he was able to make out of himself, he decided to take on the stock market, managed to um, make a small fortune there, and left the sizable state uh, to the Boris Lurie Art Foundation after his death in 2008, which, will, which now allows us to look at his life and work uh, and keep his art for future generations. Starting from his youth, uh, we will examine Lurie's biography and the most important aspects of his extensive oeuvre through his drawings, paintings, collages, writings, and documentary photographs. 
Here we see a very young Boris in a very blurry picture from the late 1920s. Um, Boris Ilya Lurie, then wrote as Lurie, as you can see on the bottom right, uh, was born on the 18th of July in Leningrad, present day St. Petersburg, to Russian speaking parents, Shaina and Ilya Lurie, which you see on the right here. Uh, Shaina, um, Orthodox Jewish but liberal Zionist uh, dentist, and Shaina, um, an industrialist in Russia, um, lived together in St. Petersburg until the state sanctioned confiscations of China's bis uh, of Ilya's business. Um, here you see Boris together with his father and his two sisters, Asha and Jana or Josefina. Um, um, after, the, after the state sanctioned confiscation of his business and fearing further crackdowns on the bourgeoisie, Ilya flees to Riga within months of Boris's birth. The rest of the family follows the next year, where China sets up a dentist practice while Ilya focuses on his new business endeavors. The children all attend the Jewish Ezra Gymnasium, a German-speaking school uh, in the middle of Riga, while the family continues to speak Russian at home. At school, Boris learns English and German. Although the language of instruction uh, changed to Latvian and later Russian following several regime changes, uh, the original German speaking school situated very strongly in the Baltic German community and the Jewish community. At school, Boris meets Lyuba Trestukunova, his first through love, who we'll uh, see later on. Very shy at first, Boris takes ages uh, before he dares to speak to her. Um, and spending years in love, she became a huge, um, well, a huge part of his life, even though they weren't, they weren't speaking at all. And throughout the years of school, um, they, clapped in so they stayed in close circles while Boris kept busy in a variety of associations and organization in, organizations in the Jewish community. Um, around this time, around the mid-1930s, his artistic talents are also noticed for the first time. As a recommendation of his mother's cousin, a commercial artist, Lurie enrolls in several art classes. And by 1937, he produces his first self-described masterpiece, a nude, which is now lost. Two years later, the family visits Asia in Italy. She emigrated there earlier after her Italian boyfriend. And on the way back to make a small stop in Berlin to visit uh, friends of the parents. They returned to Latvia the day, just one day before the outbreak of the Second World War and the invasion of Poland. With the 1939 Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, a non-aggression pact between Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union, the two powers decide on how to divide Eastern Europe. Three Baltic states were allotted to the Soviet Union and were occupied within the year. Latvia is invaded in mid-June of 1940 and incorporated as the 10th Soviet Republic a month later. During the Soviet occupation, over 300,000 Latvians are either deported or killed. The Luria family is spared, luckily. During this time, Boris gets one of his first jobs, drawing magazine illustrations and a book cover for the Jewish publishing house of the Communist Party in Riga. Although it seemed quite peaceful, the family spared some kind of uh, stagnation, seemingly. Uh, within a year after the Soviets, the German army invades and occupies Latvia. After German troops enter Riga on July 1st, the Lurie family home in the north of the city is commandeered for the Wehrmacht to use. They moved to an apartment on Stabuyela 21. On the 25th of October, the whole Jewish population of Riga, about 30,000 people at this point, is forced to relocate to the newly established, established ghetto in the east of the city. The Lurie family is housed on Lutzajela 37, which you'll see here on the right in its present day estate and on the left in a painting done by Boris just after he arrived in New York. As you can see, for the young, for the young Boris, the house seemed immense, with huge space around, even though it's a small apartment building, seemingly adding a number of floors. The memory of this place is this new place where they were put, seems much, much larger, larger than um, it was. Oh, sorry, I just now see the comments. I'll slow down a bit. Um, shortly thereafter, the ghetto of Riga split up. Um, the big ghetto, still where, where the family was placed, and the smaller ghetto, a labor camp. 
During the selection process, Boris wants to stay with a larger part of his family, his mother, sisters, grandmother, etc. His mother, possibly sensing what comes next, urges him to go with, with his father to work. He lies about his age, adding about two years, and is allowed to work with his father in the small ghetto. During the move from the large to the small ghetto, all of his works, uh, all of his early childhood works are left behind, including the earlier mentioned uh, masterpiece. On November 30th, the women, children, and elderly are sent on a death march to the Rumbula Forest, to the location you see here on the left. Um, it's a shame the picture hasn't come quite through, but you get the image. It's a large open space in the middle of the forest, quite close to Riga. Um, it's about 10 kilometers south of the city, and 13,000 of the Jews left behind are forced to undress before being shot and buried there. On December 8th, just over a week later, 12,000 others are, are uh, sent the same direction. Among them, was his mother, Shaina, his sister, Josefina, his maternal grandmother, and Liuba, his girlfriend. Boris and his father, oh, on the right here, you see a portrait he also made just after he got back, um, an impression of his mother before shooting, which he, of course, could not have seen, um, but being one of the first pictures he, he made after turning, you can imagine what an impact it must have made. Um, Boris and his father stay behind in the small ghetto until shortly before the order is given to liquidate all of them. Through the intervention of Fritz Scherwitz, who you see on the top right here, the SS officer responsible for all slave labor, labor around the city, Boris and Ilya are sent to Este Werkstätte Lenta, the labor camp Lenta, on the 25th of October. In his memoirs, he reflects on the, on the decision to go there. He writes, my father gives him some valuables and he promises that our names will be called for transfer to Lenta to roll call. We are lined up in the huge appel platz, the roll call square, in the middle of the old ghetto, now sparsely inhabited by German Jews. The square is full of Latvian police and SS men and German Jewish ghetto police. Untersturmführer Schwerwitz arrives with his entourage. Everyone is questioned as to his trade. The ones selected for Lenta march across the wide expanse of the square to the other side, some 150 meters at least, with tens of SS and various police and officers watching. Some names are called and ours should be among them, but are not. My father is now being questioned. He is ordered to the good side. Later, I am questioned and I claim to be a carpenter. I am disbelieved and am to remain on the bad side. My father is there on the good side, some 150 or 200 meters away, with police, SS, and Lenta officers in between, all watching the selection very closely. My head is swimming and I am beyond reason. My father, from very far away, is motioning to me with an angry expression on his face, motioning me to come over to his side. I start walking at normal speed across the Appel Platz like a sleepwalker, and nobody stops me or challenges me, and I'm next to my father on the good side. There's no further count, and none of the prisoners who had witnessed my crossing utters a word. That is how we both get to Lenta, but expecting any second to be stopped and challenged, hit over the head, dragged off for punishment, maybe murdered. At Lenta, Boris works as a carpenter and gardener until August the following year. By that time, he and his father are made to march to Salaspils, Salaspils uh, concentration camp Kurtenhof, where they are placed under the protection of Servites again. Eight days later, they are sent back to Lenza for six more weeks. Together with prisoners from nearby Kaiserwald concentration camp, Boris and his father are put on the steamboat Kanonier to Danzig, present-day Gdansk in Poland, where they arrive on the night of September 30th. From there, they go by barge, excuse me, they go by barge to the nearby Stutthof uh, concentration camp, where Boris is registered as a trained carpenter. In Stutthof, he's, um, in Stutthof, he's interned mainly with other Russian prisoners. Um, and a lot of uprisings also relied on a lot of punishments. And these drawings you see here from the war series he drew after his return to New York, you can see some of the experiences. A hanging at Stutov of an uh, attempted SKP and the punishment of Russian prisoners outside of the camp after they tried to imitate soldiers. Um, he later said that they were put with helms on their head and brooms in their mouth and, be, and they were constantly being um, uh, made fun of by the guards. 
At the end of October, Boris and Ilya are transferred again, this time by train to Buchwald near Weimar. On November 3rd, they arrive in satellite labor camp Magdeburg Stadtfeld, where they have to produce ammunition for Polta. Here you see Larry's registration card for Buchwald. Um, and in the top left, you see his birthday, the 18th of July, 1920, two years before his actual birthday. Uh, just just too young to start uh, to be admitted to the camps. Uh, at the start of the war, he lied about his age at the two years um, in order to in order to uh, be admitted and to save his life. <laughs> After the RAF, the Royal Air Force, uh, have a raid on the night of January 16th and destroy much of nearby Magdeburg, uh, nearly missing the ball, both the factory. The prisoners of the camp are sent to the city to clear the ruins. Boris works in the city until the 8th of April when his supervisor, an SS soldier, flees. He remains in hiding in the city for 10 more days. That uh, the 10th day, April 11th, or April 18th, 1945, uh, the satellite camp of Magdeburg Polte, where they were stationed, uh, is liberated. It's a week after Buchwald itself was liberated. After liberation, Boris returns to the camp looking for his father, as he has been in hiding in the city. Unable to find him in the camp, he heads back to Magdeburg and finds his father in a cellar, who had been taken into hiding by other prisoners. Um, at the end of April, Boris and his father are taken to a displaced person camp in Hilersleben, where they're found by his brother-in-law, Dino Rusi, the uh, husband of Asha, who by then had moved to the U.S., uh, Dino Russi, an Italian-American, worked for the U.S. Counterintelligence Corp, the CIC, uh, and was in Europe to gain intelligence on activities of the Germans, the German army. Um, he provides Boas with a job as a translator, as he speaks Russian, German, and English. Um, and Boas is stationed in Budingen, Oberhesa. At the insistence of Dino's sister, of Dino's wife, Boris's sister, Asha, Boris and his father emigrate to the U.S. They arrive in New York City on June 18th after a 12-day journey aboard the Navy ship SS Marine Flesher. We see the boat you see on the right here. This is not an image of the uh, of the arrival of the trip where Lurie was on, but about a month earlier in May 1946. After arriving in New York. Uh, Lurie starts to find a job as an illustrator for advertisements, quite ironic seeing his later work, and his father starts working in real estate. Finally able to reflect on his wartime experiences, he starts to work on a series of drawings and watercolors on, his, on the years before. He names them the War Series, works on them until about 1948, and keeps them private afterwards. The series, which includes images of his family and life in the camps, is only shown publicly after his death. Around the same time, Larry starts picking up his art studies again. Uh, by this time, he had only uh, had a few drawing classes in school um, and had no formal education besides that. He briefly joins the New York Art Students League and takes courses with artist Reginald Marsh, a socialist realist painter, and Georg Gross, who by then had also fled from Germany about 10 years earlier. But not liking the the classical way of teaching, he quits uh, soon after. Searching for his own style, uh, Lurie tries to have multiple styles, mo tries to emulate multiple artists, um, and creates these seemingly ordinary works. But if you look closely, something is happening to the bodies within the works. If we look at this work, by example, uh, inspired by Angra's Turkish bath, which is in the Louvre, uh, Lurie shows this picture of women in a courtyard uh, sitting around this body of water up on different levels. But if you look closely at their bodies, you see something different. They're slowly disintegrating. Their heads often just float and their limbs are dis disconnected from their torsos. Painted in 1947, uh, Women in Courtyard is one of the earliest examples of his dismembered women, which we'll look, take a look at in a bit. Uh, featuring large women with detached limbs and fetishized positions. The, the, uh, through the series, Lurie expresses the mixture of desire and revulsion he experienced. 
uh, when encountering the women of New York. After long years of extreme deprivation, he perceived them as extremely corpulent. Well, nicely put in his word, he uh, said these extremely fat women who have no, no regards for what's happening in Europe, clearly completely um, uh, tilted by his own experiences. He had no, um, there was no understanding anymore that anyone could have not lived through the camps as damaged as he was. Throughout the series of works of the damaged women, uh, we see the bodies uh, increasingly deconstructed. Upper and lower torso seem to come loose. Arms seem to come out of nowhere. Uh, whole bodies are turned into piles of jumbled body parts. Although Lurie by no means was the only person around this time to experiment with the disintegration of the female body. We see two very famous examples, Carol Appel in the Netherlands and Willem de Koning, also Dutch, uh, it's not meant this way, uh, but in New York at the time. Um, he's doing something completely different with it than them though. Uh, although there are some resemblances, if you remember the other works he was making around this time, the war series, all featuring his wartime experiences, you might start to see what's happening. Finally able to contemplate on the recent past, Lurie's reflecting on the loss of the women in his life. Presumably, the disintegration of the female figures in the Dismembered Women series exemplifies the loss of women in his own life. This conflation of women, sex, violence is especially visible in the Love series of the early 60s. Throughout the Dismembered Women series, Lurie starts to slowly add in fetishized objects, heels, hats, flowers, chains, leather. With the course of the series, the images started getting more sexually explicit and start invoking violence. Featuring motives of bondage and dominance, sadism, masochism, BDSM, his annihilating personal experiences of the National Socialist atrocities and the world of organized sadomasochism blend into one. In the Love series, he showcases the complex power dynamics within uh, SM practices as a reflection of the unequal relation between the genders ascribed in the structures of patriarchal society. What's interesting is when these sadomasochist paintings start displaying other things. If you look at this work, for example, Panam Red, it shows a very familiar profile. Uh, you might already recognize him. This is Vladimir Lenin. And as you see with a lot of other works uh, by Lurie, he tries to let the image speak for themselves, no matter how um, explicit they might seem at first, without a clear indication of his intention. Whether the inclusion of Lenin in this otherwise seemingly apolitical work is a sign of admiration or critique is unclear. The subtle masochism of the Love series reminded Lurie of other sides with power dynamics he was very familiar with. The concentration camp, and the art world. Around the time he painted these works, he also started working on what would become his only novel, House of Anita. Published after his death, House of Anita follows Bobby, the semi-autobiographical uh, character representing Boris himself, who lives in a titular house of Anita. In the guise of an SM novel, the, books the book makes us representations of pornography, concentration camp torture, the workings of the art market, and cynicism of the American way of life into one nearly overwhelming critique of capitalist exploitation. In the book, he attempts to come to terms with the circumstances of his traumatic youth while exploring the meaning of the life of the artist and the place of art in the work after the Shoah. Through Bobby, the main character, uh, Lurie reveals a lot about himself. Aspects we could not figure out in other aspects of his work uh, now seemingly become clearer. Circling back to the appearance of Lenin, for example, it's not immediately clear how he felt about communism in general and Lenin in particular. In House of Anita, however, he's much more explicit, declaring his adoration for Stalin, albeit for his leading role in the conquering of fascism, not his big role in the spread of communism. Uh, he has him parade through Manhattan with Red Army soldiers and tanks and has him reside in the Twin Towers. The other interesting aspect of this novel is the double role Anita plays as his mistress, but also as his gallerist. In the book, Anita exhibits Bobby as part of a performance. 
She invites collectors and curators into her home to watch her commend Bobby and the other inhabitants of her house. In front of Anita, her assistants, and the guests, they perform the most heinous sex acts, all at her will. In the house, Bobby's Jewish identity, much like Lurie's, plays a big role in the determination of his position in the hierarchy. Through a variety of slurs, he's constantly reminded of his Jewishness and the position that comes with it. Anita has one Jewish assistant, aptly named Judith, who somehow, somehow made, made it through the glass ceiling. Assimilated as she was, Judith enjoyed the benefits of the higher class while also being subject to Anita's abuse. She was still a Jew after all. At a certain point, Judith becomes the target of a conflict that has her end up completely incapacitated. Anita, a sly as a gallerist, decides to declare her work of art and exhibit her instead. In Judith, Lurie projects a consistent fear um, minorities in general and Jews specifically face all the time, that of regression back to their role before assimilation. Those who break through the barriers of the establishment often adapt their ways to secure their place. Even if, which becomes clear in the case of Judith, this means adopting the establishment's uh, xenophobia and racism, or anti-Semitism in this case, that was just earlier aimed at them. In her downfall, Judith experiences what many Jews had before her also experienced, completely assimilated up into the ruling power, up into the ruling power, powers anti-Semitism. She enjoyed the luxuries of the higher class, but when push came to shove, she was dropped down just as fast. When Judith was eventually expelled from the gallery or brothel or camp, depending on who you ask, um, she became an exhibit herself. Lurie saw something similar happening in the art world, much like people would say that they own a Chagall or have a Fostel hanging in their living room instead of a painting or sculpture by either of them. Lurie felt that he as an artist was exhibited rather than his work. The objectification of the artist was symptomatic of a sort of celebrity cult that haunted the art world. Instead of the substance of the work, people seem to be only focused on the person who made it. The higher their status, the more important the work must be. If your neighbor would empty out a cutlery drawing into a plexiglass box, for example, it would be worthless. Uh, however, if you wouldn't, would know it would have been done by someone with certain prestige, say uh, Daniel Spurry or Armand, uh, the same object would immediately be considered art worth a significant amount. If, Lurie thought, anyone can sell a pile of shit for a lot of money just because they could claim the status of art, then so can he. And he did just that. In 1964, he and fellow artist Sam Goodman uh, presented the No Sculpture or Shit Sculpture show at a gallery in New York. Piles of feces, sculpted out of plaster by Goodman and hand painted by Lurie, were placed throughout the gallery and every single sculpture bearing the name of a famous gallerist. Unsurprisingly, these did not sell well and both Lurie and Goodman had burned most of their bridges in the art world with this single exhibition. For them, however, this was all deliberate. Goodman shared the same disdain for the New York art market they were part of. In their eyes, the art world ignored societal and political issues and only saw art as a, community, as a commodity. Um, that Sam Goodman shared his view on art, shared Lurie's uh, thoughts on this, is not surprising when you look at his life. Born in Canada in 1919, Goodman lost his father very early on in an, according to him, anti-Semitic act, uh, anti act of workplace, workplace violence. As a photographer for the National Film Board of Canada, Goodman was sent to Europe during the war, where he was exposed to the aftermath of the atrocities of the show at first hand. After meeting Lurie in the infamous Cedar Tavern in 1956, Goodman would, get, would give a number of the pictures he made documenting war crimes to Lurie, who would eventually end up using them as material in his later work. Together with several other artists, including Rocco Armento and most notably Elaine de Koning, Goodman and Lurie co-found the March Gallery, uh, one of the 10th Street uh, cooperative galleries run by 23 artists under de Koning's leadership in 1957. Um, here you see the Vogel show at the Marsh Gallery, one of the earliest no art shows they held. Um, the first solo exhibition for Lurie happened the year after, in 1958, where he exhibited his black figures. The year after that, 1959, he meets another artist associated, now associated with the group, 
Stanley Fisher. Born and raised in New York City, Fisher was a teacher and a poet with an interest in the visual arts before serving as a combat medic during the war. Present at the invasion of Normandy, Fisher too was witness to various horrific sites. Back in New York, his war experiences led him to similar dissatisfaction with the culture of the post-war United States. When Lurian Goodman met him, Fisher was just busy compiling his anthology of beat literature, uh, now called East Coast Beat, if you want to look it up. Um, an anthology that would eventually include works by both Lurie and Goodman and his illustrations. Immediately bonding over their shared disdain for pop culture, Fisher joined the two artists at the March Gallery, first as a poet and later on as a visual artist. As the three artists believed society's shortcomings should not be overlooked and hidden away by the art world, so they thought you should, the art world should not, uh, they should not shy away from exposing the flaws of the art world instead. Uh, spreading the word to anyone who listened, they did everything in their power to achieve just that. The first started a group together as the March Group, named after the gallery. And the year after, under the guise of the No Art Movement, the three started their crusade. Um, starting from 1959, no, no art artists uh, said no to many things they associated with American society, hence the name. Besides consumerism and capitalism, they also rejected imperialism and militarism, exploitation and conformity, bigotry and prudery. The no art works are not unified by a certain style, but they're recognizably non-conformist and often carry similar symbols like large no emblems or swastikas. For Lurie, no art also functioned as a appeal to the art world not to forget the Shoah. Besides, uh, it's a appeal for the art world to basically dissolve itself. None of the works were sellable in the least. Taking the form of a movement instead of a fixed collective, no art existed of a wide range of artists from all over the world. As part of the no art mission was their resistance to established art world structures. The ranks featured many unknown artists, besides museum staples, such as Jean-Jacques Lebel, Enrico Bay, and Yayoi Kusama. Whether all of these were aware that they were part of the movement or just co-opted by Lurie and his peers is not always clear. Either out of sheer megalomania or as a technique of disruption, Lurie made claims to many artists who could have not joined him, the movement, either because they were not able to know about it at all or because they were simply dead by the time of the of its founding. Now uninterested in commercial success, uh, having burned all his bridges with uh, the aforementioned shows, Lurie feels not limited anymore by the demands of the art of the market and given fully to his artistic expression. Where earlier works, no matter how gruesome, still bore some similarities to art by his contemporaries, he was now able to fully distance himself from them. After arriving in the US, he was bothered by many aspects of the society he found there. Besides the indulgent consumerism, basic disdain for others, he was mostly offended by society's uh, resolution to forget the recent past, uh, a determination he saw reflected in the art world as well. He believed that avoiding any conf confrontational subject matter, the art world gravitated towards what he saw as safe and above all, sellable popular motifs. This attitude, which Lurie categorically rejected, was in his eyes most of all embodied by pop art. In his attempt at countering the empty glorification of consumer culture and uh, celebrity cult status that he saw in pop art, Lurie appropriated his visual language. Through bandai dots and solid forms, he emulates the comic-like empty optimism of the pop artists. Here shown his work by Liechtenstein and the same use of Ben Dedas on one of his uh, love series works, Blindfolded, from about the same time. While doing so, he added what he believed pop art lacked, societal critique. If you look at this work by Andy Warhol, for example, you all know this, uh, the Marilyns. Uh, these only sold well in Lurie's eyes because they were devoid of any real meaning nothing behind the image. There was nothing that could upset. They were safe, they were pretty, they were great decoration. Um, he thought we should go about it differently. Made a few years before these particular Warhols. Lurie's Altered Man series share similar motif. motif. 
uh, instead of the famous actress and societal sex symbol Marilyn Monroe, however, we're confronted with someone else, a less attractive face, U.S. Senator Henry Cabot Lodge Jr. Uh, Cabot Lodge became initially, after being a senator for a while, he became Richard Nixon's running mate for the 1960s election, 1960 election. After losing to John F. Kennedy, he was appointed as the U.S. ambassador to South Vietnam. In that position, he played a significant role in the 1963 assassination of the president, whose name I will not try to pronounce because I will not be able to, um, of South Vietnam. An assassination that led to political upheaval and possibly prolonged the war by years. Works like the Altered Man series show that in his political and societal commentary, Boris Lurie did not limit himself to the past. Current events were criticized heavily. In his depictions of contemporary news images and significant personalities, he showcases the hypocrisy of a society that condemns the atrocities of the Second World War, yet upholds the same imperialist and militarist values. In his eyes, the US thus fuels a never ending cycle of war and violence while simultaneously distracting their own population, populations through popular media. Although initially thankful for the role of the US in the liberation of Europe, he quickly started to oppose uh, the imperialist nature of US politics. In his 1963 collage, No with Miss Kennedy, he extends this general opposition to the then first lady, Jackie Kennedy. When later that year, John, her husband, uh, was assassinated, he responds with Oswald, a collage featuring the murder of Kennedy's alleged the uh, the murder of Kennedy's alleged killer, Lee Harvey Oswald. And after the CIA-backed assassination of Patrice Lumumba, the first democratically elected prime minister of Congo after the Belgians, le Belgians left, he made the following work. Mixed in with newspaper headlines announcing the death of Lumumba are fragments of both culture, the pop culture output that he believes functioned as his distraction for the general public, as well as imagery linking the U.S. overseas imperialist tendencies to the National Socialist urge to expand the search for Lebensraum. The work is part of a larger series of work, all criticizing the U.S. and all called Adieu Amérique, um, exhibited at the March Gallery in 1960, two years after the establishment of the No Art Movement. Uh, the works laid a connection between the U.S. and all the aspects of the society he despises, while also expressing his wish to leave. Adieu, Amérique. Goodbye, America. Uh, a, a wish fueled by his frustration with politics, but also by his frustration with society in general. During his time in the U.S., he has always expressed his will to settle either back in Europe um, where he was from, although he did not want to go back to Riga, or in Israel, which he saw as the only true safe haven for Jews. Um, a natural consequence of the Shoah in his eyes, um, he saw the critique of Israel in any type as anti-Semitic tendencies and was not afraid to call, it, call them out. Uh, although never realized his dream was uh, to end up in a kibbutz, um, a co-hosted uh, living space. Um, uh, although he was never, he was never able to, um, to make it. He visited Israel for the first time in 1954 as part of a longer trip to Europe, uh, his first return after the war, less than 10, 10 years after leaving. Um, he travels to Paris shortly after meeting a uh, French actress, Beatrice Le Cornu, later known as Beatrix, Beatrice Le Cornu Hamilton, with whom he would marry uh, a year later and would divorce in 1960. He travels to Paris and from there to Israel, uh, but he would not hold an exhibition there for 20 years. Uh, in 1974, he would finally have one at the Museum of Einhold, and he has had many since. Throughout the years to come, he would travel to Europe a number of times to either mount shows or meet up with friends. In Europe, Larry made a slew of fellow artists, including Pierre Soulage, who just died, Wolves, Sam Francis, and Enrico Bay. Um, after divorcing Beatrice in 1960, uh, Larry travels again to Europe in 1962, 
Together with Sam Goodman, he mounts two Doom shows at the galleries of Arturo Schwartz in Milan and Rome. Schwartz, one of the one of the few uh, European galleries who would support his work, eventually bought some bought some uh, and gave them to the big museum, the Tel Aviv Museum of Modern Art and the Israel Museum in Jerusalem. Upon his return, he meets Gertrude Stein, who would become his lover and gallerist. Interestingly, uh, not related to the Gertrude Stein. Uh, she founded her gallery, called Gallery Gertrude Stein, in '63, a year after meeting Boris. She, she opens the gallery with a show of his multiplications, and, over, and he oversees much of the programming, including the No Show and the No Sculpture Show, the shit show we just saw. As said, uh, Stein was not only his gallerist, but also his lover. Interesting, considering the content of House of Anita, where he has this mistress, uh, camp guard, and gallerist all all united in the same person. Um, but for Lurie, both Gertrude and the complex relationship he has with her are big sources of inspiration. Besides featuring her likeness in a number of works, he also reflects on the power dynamics between them in works such as the one on the right, Roses to Almighty Mistress. In the, in the collage, showing a mistress being held by a faceless naked man, his face wiped out by yellow paint, and the same pain used to give him a yellow star of David. He combines the intricate visual relations between sex, violence, power, and the Shoah, or the Holocaust. Um, and this brings us to the most complex part of his oeuvre, the one David already warned us about, the collages. In the early 60s, in the late 1950s, uh, Boris started juxtaposing documentary photographs from death camps in his art. Um, the used images had been printed in British and American magazines in 1945, alongside advertisements for lingerie, shoes, cosmetics, and other consumer goods. In his saturation paintings, Lurie combines these camp pictures, pictures from the camps after the liberation, uh, with pinups and mag for magazines. In his eyes, the oversaturation of images resulted in his voyeuristic, superficial reception of the Shoah. By recontextualizing these historic images, he emphasizes the absurd placing of advertisements while making the viewer aware of the photograph's horrifying content once again. He starts combining drawing, painting, writing, and collage to create these dense rhythm of closely knit uh, fragments. Female heads from the world of advertising, a photograph of famished concentration camp prisoners, uh, an expressive drawing sculpinating in big nose or uh, big swastikas throughout the painting. Lurie presents the reality of the show in close proximity uh, to these well-to-do women, uh, all taken from advertisements for um, hair, uh, hair dyes. Um, he wants to express that the horrific past cannot be eliminated from the present, all semblance and glamour and wealth notwithstanding. According to Lurie, the way of life is projected in these lifestyle magazines and through the advertisements is one of ignorance and hypocrisy. In other works, he comments on this. In other works, he comments on this more extensively. In Susan Sweet, for example, the father and daughter say grace before what appears to be a Thanksgiving dinner: big turkey on the table. Through the addition of a frame of pinups, however, he transforms the otherwise idyllic scene into an awkward clash between the contrasting aspects of society. Like many of his contemporaries, he uses collage to come to terms with this traumatic past rebuilding with the world with fragments from the one gone. But where others uh, use these fragments to construct a new present, he employs them to exaggerate these existing issues in society and make the viewer aware of these hypocrisies. Another work dealing with both these hypocrisies and in a different way, the motif of a young girl is Lolita which deals with the story about Adolf Eichmann, as drawn up by Anna Harent in her Eichmann in Jerusalem uh, reports from the 1961 trial in Jerusalem. When he was tried there by the Jerusalem court for crimes against humanities, he received a copy of Vladimir Nabokov's uh, Lolita from one of the guards. After reading the book, which describes the erotically charged relationship between a 40-year-old man and his teenage stepdaughter, Eichmann complained, proclaimed that he found the book disagreeable. In this work, Larry criti critiques this hypocrisy of this man who enabled the murder of millions, but found a work of fiction too much to handle due to his moral ambiguity. 
The, crit the critique Lurie expresses in a work like Lolita is extended to the society that banned Nabokov's novel while marketing pornography and at the same time suppressing all memories of the barbarity facilitated by Eichmann. In perhaps his most famous work, Railroad Collage, Railroad to America, Lurie combines the single pornographic photograph torn out of its context of clandestine sexual activity with the photograph of a heap of courses on a railway wagon. In this way, uh, Lurie creates an image where the desire to look is met by the horror of seeing. Any illusion that the striptease is taking place in front of the dead is undermined by the white torn edges around the pinup and by its larger proportions. Uh, by adding the pinup, Lurie's collage points points out that the viewers looking at images of the show and a perception comparable to the pornographic gaze. We're looking at them, they are subjects, but they have no agency in how they're perceived. When uh, his collages were made, visual access to both photographs of the show and pornographic images of women were subject to strict regulations. The bashfulness of post-war sexual morality and the historical shame of the show uh, were the reasons that these images were not considered as publicly acceptable. In a shockingly provocative collage, Boyd draws attention to these double standards in the visual economy of seduction and concealment. In the commodification of the female body in popular media, he recognized the same uh, objectification, the same inhumane actions he had witnessed in the camps. By provocatively displaying these pornographic images together with the corpse, corpses, Lurie entangles his viewers, as well as himself as an artist, in a deliberate dilemma between visual curiosity and repulsion. A year after this work was made, uh, in 1964, Boris's father Ilya dies. Uh, a complicated relationship with his father, having survived the camps, but after that, I think this, well, the typical father, uh, father, son, or parent kid um, power struggle. Um, the death of his father hit him much harder than anticipated. Uh, after the Shiva, the funeral, he stopped making art until at least 1970, only producing um, some works in, in the meantime, mainly writing. When he returns to making art in the early 70s, he starts working on his hard writings, in which he explores the tension between word and image. These works consist of images overlaid with bright and large letters resembling the then popular advertising aesthetic. But instead of presenting consumer goods, they contain a, a series of sexual innuendos. Obscuring whether their verbs are nouns, Lurie emphasizes the semantic ambiguity of sexual language. And by revealing, for example, the presence of safe in the word slave, the viewer is reminded of the delicate power relations behind sex. Or if you look at the word load, uh, featuring the same image we just saw on the railway, um, railway collage, he comments on the similarities between society's treatment of death, sex, and all the issues we just dealt with. For Lurie, the collage was the, uh, was the ultimate technique. Um, rebuilding a world from the fragments of the one he wished gone, he was able to express his innermost concerns, one of them always in the foreground, society's seeming will to forget the atrocities of the Shoah. Um, when he returns to Riga for the first time since 1941, in 1975, he pays a visit to Rumbala, the place where he lost his mother, grandmother, sister, and girlfriend. Reflecting on the visit, he writes that he sees himself like a penitent Christian every year on the 8th of December, the day of their killing, carrying a huge wooden Star of David all the way from Lutza Street to Rumbala. The people stop and stare as I collapse and get up again, stumbling under my heavy weight. Somewhere between Jesus Christ and Sisyphus, Lurie imagines himself as the self-abasing figure in a never-ending cycle of penance, atoning for his sin of survival. The only way to incorporate Rumbula, or to be incorporated in it, he writes in his memoirs, is to kneel, Japanese style, and put a knife in your stomach. Surrendering to the same fate as his lost relatives, although unlike them by his own hand, Lurie searches for a way to deal with the guilt, but by opting to bleed out from the stomach, one of the slowest, most painful deaths known to men, he still, seems to still assume blame. In his life, he never allowed himself to forget to. In his uh, infamously dark uh, apartment, he always had the shutters down. Uh, everything was painted black, except 
ironically, the wall we see here and everything was dirty. Um, he never allowed himself to forget. He's seemingly living in his collage. His apartment was completely covered in fragments reminding him, such as this one, where you see on the left, uh, one of his works next to it, images from the then liberated camps. And I believe one image just before an execution took place. Well, on the right showing is uh, the face of his uh, love, Liuba, um, who in all of his, all of his uh, works, whether his writings or visual arts, he kept referring to. In House of Anita, at a certain point, uh, Bobby opens the door and finds a, a group of um, people standing there with exit wounds between their eyes, all killed with the next shot, the same way his family did. Resembling his family and Liuba, girl resembling Yuba looks at him, points at him and says, it's you who killed me. Um, for all of his life, even though he did the, the impossible and escape, he always had to deal with the survivor guilt. In another series of Concrete Star of Davids, these one all um, knife stricken, he seems to explore the idea of surpassing the symptoms of persecution and uh, ridding himself of this feeling uh, of survivor's guilt by going to the core of the problem, his Jewishness itself. Without an identification, of course, there's no basis for persecution. If he's not Jewish, there's no way for him to have lived through all of this. But aside from this brief exploration, he chose a different route. Instead of attacking the reduction to a single element of his identity, he chooses instead to embrace it. In his oeuvre, he appropriates imposed signifiers, the golden stars, the concentration camp uniforms. Um, that caused him so much harm. Instead of hiding the heavy weight of his Jewishness, as done by so many others who all either denounced or hid their Jewishness after coming back from the camps, he instead disp displays it for the world to see. He takes the label of Jew and unapologetically builds his persona around it, perhaps as a coping strategy. Either way, he believes art was the way to redirect society and force the people to face this past and force them to see what society has done. Um, I'd like to end with one quote best outlining Larry's outlook on the role of art and himself uh, on the world. As we all know deep down, it's not by submission, coolness, remoteness, apathy and boredom that great art is created. No matter what the cynics might tell us, the secret ingredient of all art is what is most difficult to learn. It is courage. And courage is exactly that which Boris Lurie had. Thank you. Wow. To the force. Ram. Um, I don't know whether, I, yes, I'm there. A to the force. Yes, there you are. Um, a very difficult man to capsulate within an hour. Um, but I'd like to kick off, if I may, by just asking some some questions, which, to be honest with you, I, I would I would have asked you bef before the lecture as well. I mean, I, I've been having read over the last three to four, five years. His preoccupation with using sex, pornography, violence, whatever, however you want to do it, but by, by portraying the, the, the female in a uh, less than complimentary or, or in a very downtrodden, exploited way, just depending on which side of the coin you're looking at it. What do you think was the starting point for this? Because if my memory serves me correct, um, I, think, I think his first nude was very early on. I mean, it was it was it was a, a an early young teenager when he actually painted the first nude, which which you know, health healthy young man. But um, but then it, it it progressed through. Yes, no, this is um uh, a question we struggled with as well, especially with this whole curatorial staff only existing of men at this point. Um, how do we deal with this objectification of the woman in his work? Um, first of all, I think the nude he referred to as a, he painted as a young man um, did not do this in, this in a similar way. I think um, one of these early works was a nude just because that's one of the um, 
well, let's say one of the acceptable motifs in art history. Every single artist has done nudes is one of the sure. basic ways of getting to know what you're doing. Um, I think we don't know what it looked like. It might've been a very basic academic drawing, which he just liked a lot. Um, as to the, where it started with his later work, where you do see this uh, objectifying, almost exploitative inclusion of the female body. Um, we asked Katharina Sikora, a very good um, German art historian, uh, and she wrote a very large essay on it in the catalog for the show we did in The Hague, um, available through Heidje Kans, I think, if it's still available. Um, and she saw this start with, um, well, the loss of the women in his life, basically. There's this constant, um, as a young man, and having all aspects of what he saw as a female identity, motherhood, sisterhood, but also uh, partnership, being destroyed at once. He has this extreme conflation of uh, the female identity, violence, death, all of that. Um, and it's something he was seemingly never able to go, to let go of. Um, there has been quite a lot of criticism of this work. Uh, there are people who found his objectification of the female body even worse than the objectification that was happening in pop culture. Um, and I am, sometimes still on the fence, depending on which work it is, because there can be quite explicit. Um, but I think this is the starting point, and this is something, um, well, something you can almost not, well, you can always uh, confront him with it, but for someone so damaged, it seemed to be one of the only ways he could work with this. I just wonder whether, I mean, he lost his mother, you know, during the Holocaust. Yes. And, and, that, and that, I mean, it's impossible to imagine uh, for anybody to lose anybody in such circumstances, but to be so close and at such a young age. Um, and But I would have thought that you would have then glorified the female, um, not just body, but the female as, 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 as opposite to a male. You, 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 you treasure and glorify and enhance um, but his 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 anger, um, and I think that's one of the things I wanted to. The next question I wanted to ask you is: I feel having. I mean, there's many many books on on Louis, and um, some of them I've read very easily, and some of them I've really quite struggled at because um, they're not easy. Um, but more than anything else, one feels the sometimes the pent up anger, and then you see the anger being expressed, and. I wonder from your conversations with Raphael Bastelli, uh, with Gertrude Stein, uh, Stein whether, whether he was an angry man in terms of everyday uh, conversation or whether actually it was his art that allowed him to express his anger. Well, I've heard, I've heard different stories uh, about this. We were having, um, there was a, a St. Polishim host in Koblenz uh, a month ago. And then we spoke to some people who were close friends with him. And um, he was angry at times, but overall, he was a very pleasant man. He was very mistrusting. He uh, tended to put little tests to his friends to see if he could trust them, uh, giving him money to bring to the bank, for example, and then counting it afterwards. Um, but he was also very fun, apparently. Um, I think without his art, he would not have been able to find a way of expressing this. Um, so I do think that helped in releasing his anger. Um, and what you see in his art is, I understand your point about wanting to glorify um, someone, especially having lost such a, a powerful female figure in your life that early on. But I think that for him, um, it was not about the glorification of what was missing, but about um, showing those who caused uh, this thing to be missing to confront them with their actions. So in his art, it was definitely more out of anger and more out of, out of confrontation and out of the love. Um, how he was in his personal life, I can't tell you before. Um, he died when I was 10, I think. Um, so I, I did not, I did not, I've never met him. Um, but his, his um, friends and acquaintances all seem to give the same answer. Yes, he was angry, but he was also a very enjoyable uh, man. And, and maybe, maybe the art was his release for his anger. And that allowed yes. him to actually be far more human and natural, if you like, in his personal relationships. 
Jill, Jill has asked a question. Um, All right, I see it. Why do you think he used collage so much? Right. Um, what is interesting is that you've seen a lot of post-war artists that they refer back to, to collage. Um, collage became a, a big thing with Dada in the early 20th century. And you see that this, this um, after times of upheaval, of no um, rational thinking whatsoever, the First World War, the Second World War, people are always drawn to this um, this technique that that show, that has no rationality in it. Um, where for Dada, they just let things drop and then see where they landed and really played onto the chance effect. Um, after the Second World War, you saw that many artists started to use collage very deliberately. Eduardo Palazzi is a big example. Sigmar Polka does it. Uh, Lurie as well. Um, my theory, not mine, uh, my theory uh, exclusively, I think a lot of people think this, um, is that you see that the world was fragmented. Everything was broken and there was this need for either reconstruction or um, back into the old thing from the more react reactionary conservative circles or reconstruction into something new uh, in the more progressive circles and taking these fragments of the shattered world and building something new out of it um, as seen by many artists for Lurie himself I think is what's also added is this um this fascination with pop culture, with print media, and this, this establishment of new uh, social interactions and a new societal structure. Um, and yeah, I'm not sure. He was quite a good draftsman. Um, we did not get to see those works, but he was able to draw very, very beautifully. So he could have just created the things out of the new, but uh, out of the blue. But I think working with these fragments from either contemporary society or a lost society um, gave it much more effect than he was one that he was uh, wondering. I also see this connection, what Jill says, uh, I wonder if there's a col connection to uh, collage and for example, the bodies on the train. Um, that's a very good question also. And something you also see with uh, multiple uh, artists in that era. And for Lurie, you see that if I can share my screen, I Again, um, I'm not sure how. Uh, you see that in some of the Dismembered Women series. Are you able to see the screen? Yeah. Where some of these Dismembered Women uh, bodies start to look like these bodies of, um, these piles of body parts on the trains, in the camps after the liberation. Um, so yes, I do think, Jill, very, very well noticed. I do think that that played a large part in it, um, but I'm not sure, um, uh, well, I'm not sure how much of it uh, Larry did and how much he would have admitted it, that that was it. Because for how expressive he was, he also did a lot about his, um, he created this meta image and he put a lot of uh, energy and care into creating this image that others saw. Um, so like many other artists, he was not very open about uh, what drove him at all times. Bram, can I ask you, um, I'm conscious of time, but it's so, so interesting. Um, you know, the no art movement, um, which I knew, I think I probably passed, read past it once in 50 years of being involved in the art world. Um, and then you know, up comes Boris Lurie and and he was one of the founding members. Can you just tell us a little bit about that movement and this relationship with Goodman and Fisher? Um, right. So as I explained briefly, um, Lurie, Goodman and Fisher all had similar experiences, not from the same, uh, not similar experiences, but they did all uh, end up with the same view of both our society after being exposed to the um, atrocities of the Second World War. And together they felt like the art world and contemporary society were not doing enough to well to acknowledge acknowledge this basically um especially the art world uh, which they all cared about deeply but were very disappointed by um so they created this movement and again i will share the screen so you can see the poster we just had um They created this movement, uh, but it was not very well structured, to be honest. 
Um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not sure where it is right now. It's always the fun thing with PowerPoint. Here we go. Um, and if you look at this, this um, both the exhibition and the poster, this is the, um, the No Show, one of the first canonical big uh, shows of the No Art Movement. And if you look at the names, there's some huge names there. Ellen Capro, the known as the one of the, the lead lead figures of Fluxus and Happenings, uh, Jean Jacques Lebel, who's still stirring up storms, even be, his works being uh, removed from the Berlin Biennale last year, or Yayo Kusama, who is now drawing huge crowds. Um, they created these movements, this movement, and they were just basically started to look for anyone who would join them. Um, at a certain point. Uh, later on, after he met uh, Wolf Fostel at a uh, Long Island um, performance done by Fostel, he also at a certain point just asked him, I feel this kind of kinship. Do you just want to join? Do you want to join the movement? Um, but as explained very well by Matthias Reichelt, a filmmaker who's made multiple films about Lurie and who will publish the text I'm mentioning now in um, a publication next month. Uh, Larry Goodman and Fisher were also very busy with creating this image of no art. They wanted to seem more important and more disruptive than they actually were. So they made huge lists of artists who were all a part of it. There's still artists who claim to um, be part of no art. There's, um, I think, Dietmar Kirvis and Seymour Kim, who um, I don't know that well, to be honest. Um, but still upkeep the no art movement uh, in their way and lay claim to many artists. Um, and this, this, it's very clear that they chose for a movement instead of a group in order to have it something that perpetually moves, something ungraspable, something against the art world. Um, or is there anything specific you still, um, you were still aiming for? No, no, I just, I just thought it'd be interesting for everybody to actually hear about the movement that we certainly in this side of the pond, we, we knew nothing about at all. Um, right. There were, there were European artists in it. I, I remember uh, Eros, remember, I think, and yeah. um, you know, and, and a few other European artists, but um, but it was very internationally based, but there were no British artists that I know of that was uh, part of it. No, I must say also, there were many artists I've never heard of, also looking at the list now, um, which is something which I find very interesting because there's huge names and then they're just printed next to these, these extremely unknown artists who had one exhibition in their entire life um but yeah I'm, I'm not sure i think that the european aspect of it has been um uh well much much smaller than the american uh, part of it yeah. uh, even though Lurie was perceived quite well uh, and even had exhibitions in berlin uh, he did one very Im uh, impressive exhibition back at buchwald where he was interned uh, in the late 90s um but yeah there was no there was at least uh Back in the, the early days of no of the no art movement, there was no real European uh, part to, the, to it. Yeah. I think we'll finish off with uh, Tina Matania, uh, who has asked, do, do you think his openly critical view regarding US foreign policy and societal values caused some difficulty? And how did this manifest specifically in his life prior to his leaving the USA? Very good question. Um, I have not come across any real difficulties he has uh, gotten in because of this uh, openly critical view. Uh, this might be because of my ignorance, because I've missed things, but I personally think he was not important enough. He was not big enough uh, to be targeted for his views because he, well, he very early on alienated the entire, um, all the formal structures that would allow him to gain an audience. Um, so he never really made it big. He never, the only reason we still, we still have his works is because, um, he made some money and was able to leave his, his works in secure hands. Otherwise we probably would have never heard of him again. Um, the only reason, the only way I've ever encountered a Lurie, uh, Lurie's name outside of something related to him was at the Yayoi Kusama exhibition where they showed that pink poster I just showed earlier. But besides that, he was not that, um, um, he was just not that prominent in his time, which was, of course, uh, part of 
part of his practice um, and he believed that so i think that's why he was he was he's been left alone uh, quite well i don't know maybe if if anyone else maybe rafael knows of actual difficulties he, he's been gotten into uh, because of this uh, i'd love to know that because it's extremely interesting um no, but i will definitely look into this thank you tina it's a very interesting point well, I, I think we, we will also look into it together, if I may, because um, this this evening is part one of a series of uh, of events that we're doing around Boris Lurie. Um, the next will be a digital exhibition, um, and we will print a, an essay on Lurie and publish that. And then uh, in the fullness of time, probably next year, but maybe the end of this year, uh, we will bring uh, Lurie to London, um, and that will be a fascinating show. But I think I think it's just worth commenting um, that one of the things that we get so regularly in the museum here are the the heirs, relatives uh, of of good artists, sometimes very good artists, sometimes exceptionally good artists, who have not benefited from public recognition for whatever reason. In, in, in Louis's Louis case, he set out to uh, make sure he didn't get it and then and didn't require it and didn't sell any pictures because it wasn't a financial necessity for him to do so. Um, and it would probably be offensive anyway, the whole thought of commercializing his, his principles. Um, but the work that um, Gertrude Stein has uh, pioneered to uh, to develop the reputation and to make sure the reputation of Boris Lurie is long lasting. And, and Raphael Bastelli, whose um, work in Europe is uh, again, outstanding. I think, I think it shows that it can be done. Um, but as we often have these conversations here to people, it can only be done if the quality of the work will actually sustain it. It's like, uh, it's like any product. You can market it, you can be brilliant at marketing, but if the product is not sustainable, it can't last and, and doesn't. And I think what's, uh, what's really a, a model exercise here is you have this uh, incredibly interesting and incredibly talented, incredibly difficult and incredibly, I'm going to use the word disturbed in some ways um, within different contexts, uh, individual um, who has been has that quality of of, of work and intention that is allowing the uh, the activities to 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 bring him to the fore uh, to be sustainable um, and I'm quite sure that um, in a hundred years time um, Ben Uri will also be talking about Boris Lurie and in, uh, in different formats so I think that they, they deserve great credit. Bram, you deserve great credit. You, you've led us through his life story and we're, the, we're much the, uh, the great the beneficiaries as a result. So I thank you. I thank our audience. Um, please, uh, if you're in London, uh, the London Art Show, Ben Uri is the museum partner. So we've got the prime spot at the London Art Fair and it will be a wonderful exhibition. Um, the gallery is now open, thank God, at, uh, with, with an exhibition called Joy which, as I think I said, is a, reflecting a partnership that we have with the National Gallery in London. Um, and then at the end of the month, we've got uh, another Zoom lecture on Samuel Hersenberg. So a busy month, but Benury is open for business, as the, uh, the politicians say. And uh, thank you so much indeed, and Happy New Year. Bram, again, our thanks. Thank you so much.